Okay, so I'm going to uh, give you an overview of our experience with tumour infiltrating lymphocytes in the Metasite in Manchester. Uh, so Metasite uh, is a company that came out of the University of Manchester some years ago. Um, our previous experience was in uh, CAR T cells, which some of you may be familiar with, which has been having uh, quite a significant impact in the uh, leukemia field. And uh, a few years ago, we got quite interested in tumour infiltrating lymphocyte therapy, following from a number of trials in the US, which showed clinical benefit in cutaneous melanoma. So what is TIL therapy? TIL are immune cells which have infiltrated the cancer mass. Um, and these cells can be isolated in the lab from a biopsy and expanded to huge numbers before reinfusion to the same patient. And it's got a long history, so it's been a therapy that's been available to a number of patients for probably the last uh, 20 years. Um, but recently, in the last 10 years or so, there's been a number of changes to the manufacturing protocol and to the treatment process, which has had a big impact on increasing the response rates. So the first change has been what's been called the young till process, and that's a shortened manufacturing time, which, which enables the cells which grow out to be healthier when they go back into the patient. And the second change is uh, preconditioning chemotherapy. So what that means is that before the patients receive the till uh, therapy infusion, uh, they get um, a short dose of uh, chemotherapy to deplete the existing immune system. And that allows the new infused products to be able to engraft and find space to grow and not have any competition for resources. So melanoma, cutaneous, cutaneous melanoma TIL trials are now regularly achieving response rates of 50% with a 10 to 20% complete response rate. And uh, we've treated over 30 patients with metastatic cutaneous and non-cutaneous melanoma uh, with a 50% response rate and uh, four cures or at least complete responders who are showing durable remissions. So this is the overall uh, manufacturing process. So we work closely with the Christie Hospital site and the patients will have their tumours resected and the tumour comes to our lab where it's dissociated using enzymes into a single cell suspension. And then we culture these cells in the lab and we add something we call IL-2 which um, if you go back to this morning and thinking about those different immune cells that we might be interested in, the T cells, which are the ones that we really like, um, IL-2 is effectively the food for T cells. That when they get IL-2, they go crazy. They start increasing in number. They start getting really activated. Uh, so we expand those cells for around two to three weeks. And then we put them through um, another process in which we increase their number to it. A, a, effectively a therapeutic dosage, which is hundreds of millions of cells. And then um, the patient receives these cells back. So the patient will have their preconditioning chemotherapy before they get the cells back. And they also receive the IL-2 that we use to grow the T cells out in the lab. They receive that as, a, as a, an infusion as well after the cells have gone back in. So it helps the new immune system to engraft in the patient and hopefully persist long enough to have an effect on the cancer. And that's, that's our manufacturing site in Manchester there, which is just a few miles from the Christie. So this is um, a list of a number of historical TIL clinical trials going back quite a long time to when they first started this in the US, Steve Rosenberg's group in the United States in the early 90s, uh, looking at melanoma. And they, they tried in a few other cancers, but really it wasn't until Later on, they started to get these really substantial response rates of over 50% with um, cutaneous melanoma. And recently, uh, they did a trial in uveal melanoma in the US, and they saw around 30% objective response rate and uh, one person who had a complete response to treatment. So going back to the previous talk and the discussion of these waterfall plots, this is the waterfall plot from that particular trial in uveal melanoma. So you see some patients who had progressive disease following treatment um, and some patients who had a partial response and, and one patient who had a, a complete response to uh, TIL therapy. So these the, this is the list of patients that we've treated in Manchester um, going back to 2000 and 
uh, 13, I think, the first patient we treated. Um, so you might spot in here a number of uh, patients with uveal melanoma that we've treated, most of them cutaneous, a few mu mucosal and acral melanomas, which are also uh, quite rare um, melanomas of different anatomical sites. Uh, we've had uh, uh, four complete responders, all within all, all patients who'd had uh, cutaneous melanoma. And these are patients who failed all of our previous standard treatment uh, regimens. So all the patients that we get now through for till manufacture have previously failed uh, standard of care. So uh, nivolumab and ipilimumab. And I wanted to show you some case studies. So um, this was a, a patient we had who had a, a very good partial response in metastatic cutaneous melanoma. So um, she'd had uh, a tumor in her spine um, and also uh, a large tumor uh, just on her back there, uh, which after treatment, you see the, the, the spine had completely cleared up. This tumor here completely cleared up as well. And uh, I think the, the, the one patient that we're particularly um, happy about was uh, this uh, young boy we treated some years ago who had a large, uh, this is an, a, another cutaneous melanoma patient who had extensive uh, tumor in the airways, which was causing obstruction on the airways. Um, and uh, they completely cleared up. And he also had... Um, was discovered after treatment. He had uh, brain metastases, which would have actually prevented him from getting the tilth infusion if they, they'd been noticed before he was given the infusion. Um, they also cleared up as well. So his brain mets also went, and uh, he's uh, six years out now, completely tumor free. And I think, uh, I think the reason why I'm here today is really to discuss our, uh, some of our experiences in uveal melanoma and the future of immunotherapies and where um, there might be the possibility of intervening. Um, so this is um, a patient, this is our best response in a uveal melanoma patient. Uh, this patient who had, this is the um, tumor in the liver and uh, that shrunk quite considerably, but that was the best response that was achieved and uh, um, the patient progressed after that, unfortunately. So I wanted to go through how, how this treatment works and where we are currently with this treatment and what we're doing in the lab to potentially make this treatment potentially better and available to more patients and um, more efficacious and also potentially to be able to intervene in other cancers outside of melanoma as well. Uh, so I was trying to create, think of some analogies the other day for explaining what is a very complex and uh, elaborate uh, way that your body is able to uh, recognize and destroy cancers. So the, the, one of the best ways I think I could think of this is to think of uh, your ca your, the cancer cells as having locks and uh, the T cells, which are the main protagonists of uh, an immune response to cancer, they have the keys and they might, may or may not be able to recognize the, the lock and, un, un, and un, unpick it. And your T cells effectively carry effectively two keys and there's different combinations. So humans, it's predicted it will have approximately 25 million different combinations of keys. And it's hoped that every single combination that every person in this um, room has will be sufficient to be able to recognize anything that the immune system is able to encounter from viruses to cancer to bacterial infections. And when the right combination is found, the T cell responds to that lock and creates copies of itself. And that's uh, the basis of vaccination is creating a pool of cells which are then able to recognize and destroy that pathogen if it's re-encountered. So I guess one of the problems that we face with uh, uveal melanoma and, and, and any melanoma outside of cutaneous is that effectively the number of locks that are available to the immune system are, are, are less, there's fewer of them. And that's due to, um, there was some discussion I, I noticed this morning around mutations 
So in cutaneous melanoma, there's lots of mutations. And that effectively creates lots of locks that the T cells are able to potentially recognize. And in uveal melanoma, the number of mutations is lower. So the chances of your immune system, any one of your cells in your immune system being able to recognize that cancer is, is, is smaller. And that's a challenge in, in immunotherapy. So we're thinking of a number of strategies that we can use to try and enhance the immune response uh, to these um, types of tumors which are less able to be recognized and dealt with by your immune system. So this is just uh, a schematic representation of the different strategies that we're using at the moment. And I'll just very briefly go over these. Uh, so first is what we call um, monoclonal TCRs. So what this is, is identifying the keys involved in recognizing cancers and giving other cells the right keys to be able to do the job. Um, so the, the way we do this is we use this, um, uh, we're currently using this fancy bit of equipment. Um, and what this does, hopefully this will play. Yeah. Um, so what you're doing here is you, you get T cells from the patient and you run them through the machine and um, it encapsulates them in a tiny droplet of oil. And then when you do that, you're able to uh, perform um, DNA sequencing on every single one of those droplets. And you're hoping that every single one of those droplets contains one T cell and it'll contain the information in that droplet for that set of keys that's required to re potentially recognize the cancer. <clears throat> so what we do is before the patient receives their till infusion, we look at the sequences of these keys that are in there and uh, we'll make some plots so we can identify what key A and key B looks like. And then if the patient has a good response to therapy, we can redo that again. And then what we notice in this example is that the blue-black combination has increased in frequency. Therefore, that is the combination of keys that has been involved in recognizing that cancer. And so this is an example of the kind of data we get. Um, and hopefully what you might see, I've just highlighted these. Uh, so the yellow bars are the frequency of those keys when they go back into the patient, and the blue is six months after treatment. And you'll notice that some of these effects of these keys increase in frequency during this time period, so they're potentially the ones that were involved in the, the immune response to the cancer. And once we have that information, we can uh, repackage the DNA that's involved in making those keys, and uh, we use um, uh, lentivirals particles, so, some smart person many years ago realized that if you take uh, the HIV virus and you strip out all the pathogenic elements that make it dangerous, you can then repackage this DNA that you've discovered into these viral particles, and you can use this as a Trojan horse effectively to carry that DNA information into any cells that you want. So we can take T cells from a healthy person from just from taking blood from their arm, and we can give them the information that's required to give them this, these sets of keys which enable them to recognize any cancer that we're interested in. So just as a proof of principle, these are um, sequences that enable T cells to recognize melanoma. And uh, this, e this is uh, uh, healthy T cells retargeted to melanoma tumor lines in a dish. And we see that they, this is the amount of killing. So the the healthy T cells are, are killing these melanoma tumor lines. And then if we mismatch the lock, then they don't kill anymore. So the next strategy we're taking, um, it was quite a challenge for me to think of an analogy for this, so hopefully you'll follow this one. <laughs> Um, imagine this, uh, these, these sets of keys this time are, are actually switching on a, um, the ignition on a car. And uh, you can switch on the ignition, the car will start running, but it's not going to go anywhere unless you uh, apply some acceleration to it. And that's normally how the immune system works. So when a T cell recognizes its target, it gets switched on, but then it won't actively do anything robustly 
unless the acceleration is depressed. And there is a way for the immune system to be, uh, to have a break applied as well. So there's, there's, there's a flip side to this, um, this go signal. And normally what happens is if uh, the ignition is switched on, the T cells will start to increase in number and they'll also start to produce their own IL-2. So this drug that I was mentioning before will start to be secreted. And if you um, apply the acceleration, you'll get lots more T cells and lots more IL-2. And if you apply the brake, you're gonna get restricted expansion of these cells. Unfortunately, in cancer, this process very rarely takes place. So the best you can hope for in, in an anti-cancer response compared to a, one to a virus is, is this kind of level of expansion. So the new, new immunotherapeutic drugs like nivolumab and ipilimumab target this process so they prevent the tumor from applying the break to the immune system and hopefully convert this to this. But then it's, it's rarely that you get this effectively this process happening. So we've been trying to engineer T cells and engineer TILs to be able to have that, um, this go signal artificially. Um, and so we're targeting different tumor markers, um, like CEA or GP100, that some of you may be fam familiar with in melanoma, to arti artificially apply that um, expansion effect to uh, the, uh, the, the TILs that go back into the patients. And so this is just some data, proof of principle data that we can do this. So uh, don't, don't worry too much about it, but these across here are, are two different um, tumor cell lines that we've, we've, we grow in the lab. Uh, we've got three donors. And just imagine this, this axis here is effectively the amount of activity that's going on in the dish. Um, and you can see that when we have um, just the ignition alone, without this additional stimulation, we get this amount of activation. And when we apply this artificial um, GO signal, then if it's, it's roughly doubling the response to the tumor. Um, so I won't worry too much about that, but that's just showing that there's, um, without the, this, what we call this co-star, we get around 10% of the cells responding to stimulation. And when we apply the co-star, we're getting up, we're effectively doubling, tripling the response rate. Um, so we've been validating this in uh, colorectal and ovarian cancer. And we found a number of specific targets for ovarian and colorectal, ovarian and colorectal cancer that enables us to enhance the, uh, the proportion of the T cells that recognize those particular cancers. And uh, we've been doing a lot of work optimizing um, the engineering of the T cells to find one that works the best. So we have here these particular variants which are better than our existing uh, uh, prototype receptor that we've engineered. And uh, finally, this was something that we've, we've looked at in uveal melanoma is what we call our T-switch technology. So if we go back to our uh, um, therapy schedule we were discussing before about the requirement for the preconditioning chemotherapy that the patients currently get, and then they also get the IL-2 after they've been treated. And we really want to try and get rid of the IL-2 because it's the most toxic part of the entire TIL um, treatment process. So there's actually, the, the TIL themselves are associated with very few side effects. They're, they're generally not particularly severe and can generally be managed by uh, most medical teams. But the IL-2 that goes with the therapy is currently uh, very, very toxic and there's only a few sites in the UK that can manage the side effects that are associated with that. So we want to try and get rid of the IL-2 if possible and potentially replace it with something that's less toxic. So uh, our, our um, concept is to introduce into the T cells um, a receptor that just sits on the surface of the cell, which recognizes something other than IL-2. 
So in this case, we've got um, um, a receptor which responds to a drug called l trombopag which is given to patients with uh, thrombocytopenia. Um, and it provides to the T cells the same signal that the IL-2 does, but without the systemic toxicities that the IL-2 does. Um, so we're able to show if we engineer T cells with this receptor, that they respond to the drug and they, they increase in frequency. And we've also um, engineered variants. So there is a natural hormone that circulates in your body that we have concerns that may also activate this receptor. So we've also engineered one which doesn't respond to the, to the hormone. And we see that that responds much less to the hormone than the original variant does. <coughs> So that's just to show that it works in primary T cells and also in our till as well. So this is a uveal melanoma till there. Um, and then this is just data showing that in ovarian till and also in melanoma, if we mix T cells and tumor cells, then quite what, often what happens in the lab is that the, the T cells, they'll recognize the tumor and then they go on and, and effectively die because the, uh, the, the tumor cells are spitting out um, all kinds of chemicals which impact the ability of the T cells to survive. If we engineer the cells and then add the drug, then what we see is that the, the, cells are able to, the T cells are able to survive better in the presence of the tumor cells. And we see that with, with our other receptors down here as well. They start to expand in response to the, to the, the drug that we give them. So uh, we've successfully delivered TIL for treatment of metastatic melanoma, um, metastatic um, yeah, cutaneous and non-cutaneous melanoma, with a number of patients achieving long-term benefit or cure. So currently, as I said, they, they, although we've treated far fewer non-cutaneous patients, um, all the cures have been re currently been restricted to the, um, to the patients with cutaneous melanoma. And so we've, we've performed a, a detailed analysis of the, of the T, TCR repertoire, so that's effectively the, uh, those keys that have been used by the T cells to recognize the cancers, and we've found um, uh, sets of keys which, uh, which are really important for uh, the responses during the treatment. So we've found uh, five TCRs which recognize a protein called GP100, which is um, expressed in cutaneous and non-cutaneous melanomas. And um, we've developed a number of engineering strategies for, for our TIL. So we've, we've engineered receptors which um, give a targeted co-stimulation to enhance the activity of, of, our, of our TIL. And we've also um, optimized variants of this receptor which appear to give survival advantages over our first generation co-stars. And then we've also developed this T-switch technology, uh, which provides a drug-inducible growth and survival of, of the TIL. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to uh, briefly cover uh, the advanced therapy treatment centers. So uh, the UK government, through the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult, has established three centers in the UK to accelerate the development of cell therapies. So it's quite obvious over the last few years that cell therapies are gonna be, are gonna have a massive impact in cancer therapy in the, in the coming few decades. But currently we don't really have the infrastructure in place in the UK to, to handle that. So there's very few sites in the UK with the expertise to be able to deliver these very complex therapies, to manufacture and deliver these very complex therapies to large numbers of patients. So the, the, I guess the, the, the big story in adoptive cell therapy, this kind of um, patient-specific cell therapy approach to treating cancer has been CAR-T cell therapy, which has had a massive impact in the treatment of childhood leukemia. Um, and I believe there's a, there's a documentary on the BBC tomorrow, which um, which uh, probably quite interesting to, to look at, because that's explaining the kind of, I think they're getting you know, over 90% uh, response rates in, in children with um, 
uh, leukemia, which has been refractory to standard chemotherapy. So the, the UK government is, is, is trying to think ahead and are trying to establish some of these um, centres of excellence across the UK. Um, it's established three centres, the, the Northern Alliance in Newcastle and Edinburgh, um, IMATCH in Manchester, and the Midlands and Wales uh, ATTC, which is in Birmingham and Cardiff. And um, us as a company, we're part of two of them, so we're part of IMATCH and MWATTC. And our role is as a manufacturing site to um, think about how we're going to manufacture these complex therapies. And particularly in IMATCH, we're having a uh, we, are, we play a big role because of our interaction with Chris, the Christie site, which is heading the, the IMATCH consortium. So with, with IMATCH, it's um, a consortium of a number of uh, companies and uh, NHS and clinical sites who are all working together to think about how we're going to be able to deliver these very complex therapies over the coming few decades. Um, so us there as a manufacturing site, uh, the Christie, uh, Manchester University, Manchester University NHS Foundation Trust, um, a number of other small um, biotechs, um, clinical trial companies, all working together, and also some companies which are involved in thinking about how you're going to get um, these products from the manufacturing site to the clinical site, because th they're not like a tablet that you can just put on a shelf and, and leave there for several months. These are uh, patient-specific treatments which have to be stored in a very specific way, which have to be shipped in a very specific way. So it makes the, the overall thinking about how these treatments are going to be delivered to patients that much more complex. Um, so I guess the, the, the objectives are to, um, to maximise the access of these very complex therapies to patients um, through sample collection, um, manufacturing and scaling up the process uh, sample tracking to make sure that these, because these are samples which come from a patient and have to go back to the very same patient, making sure that there's a traceability between the manufacturing and the patient so that the patient definitely gets back the product that they, that they should do. Um, scaling up the clinical settings to make sure there's, there's enough clinical sites and enough uh, beds available for uh, these treatments as they become more popular. And uh, the safe delivery of these um, these products as well. Uh, so I guess we'd really like to thank um, Innovate UK, the, the, the government arm which has given us uh, some matched funding to uh, do some of this work and to start to think about conduct conducting some clinical trials. Um, Robert Hawkins, our CEO, um, who was a medical oncologist at the Christie for many years and retired earlier this year, to take on more of a role at the company. Um, we've got a, a huge team now and a huge number of interactions with different sites and different companies to try and uh, potentially generate a number of um, treatments and uh, products over the coming few years. Uh, yeah, thank you. And if there's anyone, any questions? Can one, person's t uh, can one person's T cells be used on another person, or is it a bespoke procedure? I did have a word in, uh, so I, I went through my presentation the other day, and, and um, the one criticism I had was I used the word allogeneic and autologous, and they said, you've got to get rid of that, because no, no one will know what you mean. So currently, this therapy is what you call autologous. So that means that the cells that are being manufactured have to come from one patient and go back to the same patient. With TIL therapy, that currently has to be the case. And the reason for that is that the T cells recognize very specific patient um, mutations and antigens. Um, the engineering process where you recognize effectively the keys and give them to other T cells, there's the possibility of that process being um, what you call allogeneic. So that's where you make one product and it's able to be delivered to lots of people. Um, there's a big push at the moment to try and make these therapies more of an allogeneic product. And the reason for that is that you can make lots of batches of um, this effect of this drug from one small starting material. That means you can treat more patients, which means it brings down the cost. That means that more patients can be treated. Um, currently, there's lots of challenges to making these kind of drugs 
allogeneic or be available to lots of patients. Um, there's some ethical reasons why that can't, isn't quite done yet, and there's also some practical reasons. So currently, the, the best hope is that you could probably make enough batches to treat between 10 and 100 people. Um, if you're thinking about treating thousands, then it's, uh, currently it's, 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 not, it's not feasible. Will Brexit affect funding of the research? Um, yes and no. I think from a, I mean, generally the scientific community has been against Brexit because scientific research um, is massively dependent on the expertise of scientists from all over Europe and all over the world. I think if there is a restriction on European scientists coming in, then we'll have to think about where we're going to attract knowledge and expertise from other places around the world. Um, depending on how Brexit goes, will probably influence the kind of access to money from Europe that could be available. So currently there's quite a lot of money that goes into scientific research, which comes through what's called a H2020 and other, and other consortiums, which is European focused research uh, money, which goes to different sites around Europe. And I think with some of the Brexit agreements that were discussed, we'd still have access to that kind of funding. Um, we'd probably pay in and be able to get, still have access to that funding. With some of the other Brexit ones that I've seen, we'd probably not be able to access that at all. So it's still a bit up in the air. Uh, three centres in the UK, so there's a Northern Alliance, which is Newcastle and Edinburgh, and I think they're more focused on less on T cell therapies and more on stem cells and things like that. Um, the IMATCH and the NWATTC are much more focused on uh, thinking about T uh, these kind of cancer therapies. Um, the cost per treatment, so um, it's a difficult one. Um, so currently, we're not conducting clinical trials. We, we, we do what are called um, specials. So these are one-off patient treatments. Um, and it's largely cost reimbursement. Obviously, as these therapies come through, there's going to be a cost associated with them. And some of them are extraordinarily high. So if you think about the CAR T cell therapy, that's got these really good responses in leukemia, talking of over £300,000 a patient, maybe up to £500,000 a patient. Um, but it's still really up in the air. I mean, you know, even, even if you think about, uh, they, they sound high, but the standard, a lot of the standard treatments that are available are really high anyway, so... Um, you know, bone marrow transplants and things like that, which are very regularly given to patients with leukemia, are still, you know, over a hundred thousand pounds, I think. Um, but hopefully, with the progress of the allogeneic products, where you can potentially give these treatments to lots of patients, that'll drive down the cost. And, uh, and I've heard people talking about less than ten thousand pounds of treatment in the future. So hopefully, fingers crossed, that'll be a reality. Any more questions, uh, anyone? If not, uh, thank you again for your talk. Thank you. Uh,